The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. I'm very pleased to be here with all of you today. It's a great city and it's practically the home of ADM. You may uh, know that our company was founded here in 1902. In fact, at the uh, reception hour, we, I spoke with many folks who remember either the historic roots of ADM or really understand and appreciate how important uh, Minneapolis and Minnesota is to ADM. Our headquarters were here until 1969. And today, as uh, Steve mentioned, we're a very large uh, global agribusiness and we're serving what we call the vital needs for food and energy. Uh, the Twin Cities have um, facilities for us. Uh, we have grain merchandising, milling operations, and I'm very pleased that several of our colleagues are here from uh, ADM to join us all this afternoon. We have a number of other facilities throughout the state. Maybe a few quick uh, facts about uh, our Minnesota operations. In Marshall, we have a corn plant that uh, makes many ingredients for food, including sweeteners and starches. In Red Wing and Mankato, we have oilseed processing facilities where we process soybean and flax and canola into a variety of products. We have an animal feed plant in Glencoe. Uh, we have river terminal facilities in uh, Red Wing and Renona. And we have elevators for grain and beans uh, actually throughout the state. And there's many valued customers, and I was so pleased uh, to see some of them on the list today. Of course, General Mills, uh, Land of Lakes, uh, Hormel, uh, Schwann, and of course Cargill, our very honored uh, both competitor and valued customer. So uh, Minnesota is, is very close to us, and, and we're very happy to, uh, to share some of the same objectives. You know, we talk about our objectives are to be able to serve these vital needs and our ability to help feed the world uh, the state is very important in that as well. I, I looked at some statistics about ag agricultural exports. I sit on the President's Export Council and when you think about what exports can do for the country, what it can do for the state, it's a completely bipartisan uh, effort that the more we can produce and export to others, the more that helps our, our local economies and our state's economies. From 2000 to 2012, total ag exports in Minnesota grew 265%. Now it's a, an astonishing number and it's even greater than the very large number for all of the U.S. which grew 176%. So I think Minnesota should feel very proud of its movement from being the sixth largest producer up the ranks to the third or fourth largest uh, exporting state in the U.S. Food processing and agricultural is a very important part of this economy. It creates uh, quite a few jobs, uh, more than 70,000 in the state uh, related actually to exp ag exports alone. So I think we're kind of united in this effort of helping to feed the world. And at a time when the world is growing, the population is growing, the diets are changing. It's actually an important and to me a very gratifying business to be in. I thought I'd talk today, or I chose my comments today, to talk about the global, the growing middle class in the global economy. And I think it's important because it is driving the need for more food, for more exports. It's certainly driving growth in my business. And I'm uh, making some assumptions, but I think it would be fairly important to many of your businesses. So while my comments today I may use as an example some of our industry, I hope the topic will be applicable to many of you. So we may all be familiar with the phrase the growing global middle class, but I think the magnitude of it and the importance of it may be somewhat underappreciated. And I think it's worth learning a little bit more about because I think this impact will be significant over the next decade or so. Now we all probably know that our consumers and our customers are very different than they were just a decade or two ago. So let's review a little bit of that and then see how that might apply to the future. So in 2004, let's start with China. In 2004, General Motors sold one car in China for every 10 cars they sold in the US. Just five years later, it was one for one. One car in China, one car in the US. And General Motors, of course, like many companies, are growing and they're growing globally, but they're also growing in the US, so a significant 
uh, number. China has 54% of their urban households own a computer. And almost 100%, 98.9% have cell phones. The socioeconomic and I think the political landscape have likewise shifted. 20 years ago, China had barely entered the global economy and now it's the world's second largest economy. Global policy in that time emanated from the G7 or the G8. Today we talk about the G20. And of course, we're more connected than ever before. In, uh, I listened to Steve talking a little bit about my career and, and uh, you know, as someone who's 61 years old, I'm sort of on the back nine maybe rather than the front nine. And I remember in 1998, we didn't have interconnectivity. I think 1999 was sort of the first time we became connected, right, the web. A billion and a half people are online today. So I think sometimes this financial crisis we had in 2008, if I could go back to that, and the slow recovery we've seen in the US, perhaps it's caused us to be a little myopic in our view about the opportunities and the sweeping changes that are occurring. So I don't think that is as helpful as it would be to pay attention to some of these tectonic shifts that have occurred or the trends in our population and in our markets. And I think the opportunities are there for actually decades to come. Now, I'm not an expert in all the trends. In fact, um, as part of, <clears throat> gonna find some water here. As part of our latest effort to look at strategic um, opportunities over the next decade or so, we've undertaken some pretty significant trend analysis. So looking over the long term at global trends. And while some of them, uh, again, I'm not an expert in, there are some that we've been watching quite closely for several, several years. And these are trends related to the middle class growth and its impact on GDP and what it will mean for global demand in our business, food, feed, agricultural products. So let's talk about a couple of them. The first one's called the shift from west to east or maybe the big crossover or the uh, great rebalancing in the world. And it's a recognition that in this decade, the locus of economic growth, of course, has shifted. And the middle class that's rising with it will shift from OECD nations to more developing or an emerging economies. And the shift is happening very fast. So over the next 10 years, GDP capita will rise five times as fast in emerging companies than it will in OECD countries. And just two years from now, the number of Asian, what we'll call middle class consumers, will be larger than Europe and North America combined. By 2021, same trends will continue. There will be more than two billion Asians in this middle class. And if we look out to 2030 and beyond, it will be the first time in the world's history that the population the majority of the population will not be considered impoverished. That should be very good news. The middle class will be a more and more important social and economic uh, thrust, a very important impactful sector of the economy. Now Asia has surpassed North America and Europe combined in GDP, um, or, it, or it will, by both population size, military spending, and technological development. And it's not just a China story. It's China, it's India, it's Brazil. There are certainly regional players, uh, Cambodia, Indonesia, Nigeria, South Africa, Turkey. They are all rising in economic power and the middle class. And of course, these changes won't happen all at once. Some people think about the sweet spot. What is the sweet spot when a significant number of people move from what maybe is an equivalent of about $10 a day in economic power, they move out of poverty and start moving towards the middle class. We see that uh, in India and Indonesia, they're hitting that sweet spot here in the next three years. A couple of years later, probably the Philippines and Vietnam. And for places even like Pakistan, Nigeria, Bangladesh, they are further off, but again, if the same trends continue, they will be in that same situation soon, maybe by 2025. So in the US, some people ask, well, this is the global economy. What about the US? I think this growing middle class globally actually also helps continue to see the US economic recovery. And with the right strategies in place in the US, whether it be around trade policies, educational practices, I think the rising global middle class will help the US middle class 
uh, expand as well. Now we identified in, um, in our research two virtuous cycles that play in this economic rise of the global middle class. The first is uh, around declining dependency rates. This is where there's a growing workforce and birth rates are declining. So more women in the workforce globally and they're choosing or they are having less children. So family size, dependency size uh, diminishing. And then the second cycle is this urban migration, people moving from uh, farm or rural areas to, to major cities. And the movement of to cities is something that I find particularly interesting because I think it gives us a more visceral picture of what's happening um, with, this, with this change. Approximately 600 million people in this new middle class will live in 400 cities. And these are not just the major mega cities we all know of, of Tokyo, Delhi, Mexico City, Shanghai. These are what you might call the middleweight cities, which will have 10 million or more people. They'll contribute more than half of global GDP growth. There are places like Wambo, Fushan, Hyderabad, Medan, Vina del Mar, and Barranquilla. They're not all places that maybe we've been and we think about where's that next level of opportunity. I think these new urban centers and the economic power they'll hold will um, really lead to a shift in the economies as a whole. People will talk about economies as a whole. Instead, more about city economies within, within states or within countries. So what does this trend mean for us as, as perhaps business leaders? And how do we position our companies to serve these middle markets or these middle class uh, consumers and customers in some of these middle weight cities, in some of these emerging economies? Well, let me talk about three concepts that I think are somewhat applicable, maybe even universally applicable. But I'd like to give you some examples in, in our industry. And the three concepts are productivity, connectivity, and sustainability. OK, so productivity, connectivity, and sustainability. We probably all need to be more productive. So productivity on many levels, productive workforces, more productive with resources, more productive with capital, and more productive with technology and innovation. Today, sort of um, the Western, uh, if we consider our sector, let me start with our sector in agriculture will need to become more productive. And I think to serve overall demand, to serve overall demand in the next 40 years, think about this, we have to grow or produce more food in the next 40 years than we had to in the last 10,000. So it's a challenge for the industry. It's a challenge for the market. To serve the overall demand of the world, we'll have to produce more in the 40 years than we did in the last 10,000. So in addition to more food, a growing middle class sometimes demands better food, right? Better diets, more protein in their diets. Uh, in Southeast Asia, for example, per capita consumption of meat is expected to grow 60%, from about 38 kilograms to uh, over 60. Uh, the same thing's happening in Latin America, that same kind of meat consumption from 32 grams to 77. Their rate is even going higher. So as populations move up that income curve and they move into cities, not only is there a greater demand for, say, protein, but it's also a greater demand for convenience foods, maybe more indulgence foods, maybe more convenient portion sizes. Uh, today, Western convenience brands, whether they're fast food chains or offerings that are in grocers um, from retailers, they're building markets in Africa and Asia. I used to travel in my Chevron days to Nigeria in the 80s, and I remember there was really nowhere for Western food. Even, even hotels didn't have Western food. We build compounds, and that's where we perhaps had a few familiar foods. Today, you can go to Nigeria. There's dozens of not only hotels, but even the, the KFCs, the Domino pizzas. Uh, you can go into the grocer and find individual packages for working families that just want the meal for the day, more uh, just like we might see at our, our Kroger or our local uh, delis. So to meet this growing demand and changing food preferences, global, global agriculture starting at the beginning will need to grow more crops. We'll need more capacity to store them. We'll need more processing facilities to turn them into products that these middle class consumers demand. And we'll need more ability to move products around the globe. Which brings me to the second concept, which is uh, connectivity. 
I think the idea of a global network and the more geographically diverse middle class that we have will require a network that connects where the food is grown, where the goods are, to where they will be consumed. And it's not just food or goods, it's money, it's data, it's people, it's ideas. This interconnected globe will need to cross borders and flow around the world more than it ever has before. In agriculture and the food industry, you know, companies like ourselves work with global networks and capabilities, and I think we should and we need to play a key role in connecting uh, more harvests to more homes throughout the world. You might note today that, of course, where food is grown, where ideally there are good climates, good soil, and where food is demanded, uh, i.e. the populations are growing, are certainly in disparate places, right? So we grow food in North America, South America, Europe generally, and yet the demand is growing in Asia, in Africa, in the Middle East. So this idea of connectivity um, and uh, an ability to have good exports, good processing, good marketing networks, and so forth, businesses will go and will look to go where that growth is. Uh, some examples for us, of course, is we're growing in Brazil and other areas of South America, Paraguay. Uh, we're growing in the Black Sea region, the Danube, in uh, uh, more export capability and investments in the Middle East, Africa, and Asia to accept it uh, on the other end. The third concept is sustainability. So if we think about um, resources, sometimes there'll be resource constraints associated with this new world. There may be uh, a different way that resources are priced in order to understand that there's some resources that are finite. This global middle class will demand more on resources. And I think as business leaders, we are probably considering uh, very specifically, all of us, how we meet this challenge of finite resources. We know that agriculture already consumes 70% of the world's water, uh, or 70% of the water consumption is, is for agriculture. So we need to think about how we grow more, make more, produce more, and yet use less in resources. And I think agriculture has a lot to be proud of in the great strides they've already made in this area. Um, many examples, but just since the 60s, global wheat production has tripled, and yet we're only using 6% more land. We produce two and a half times more corn per acre than we did 50 years ago, and we do it with less water and less inputs. Soybean production has increased more than double the rate of the land we've added to use it. So just as three quick examples of Certainly uh, agricultural, we know here in, in Minnesota, it's made tremendous track record in deploying innovation and improving productivity. Uh, at ADM, we also continue to look at our footprint. We have very aggressive goals uh, around energy reduction, water reduction, making the most of sort of every kernel, every stock, every kernel uh, we touch. And we're also active in preventing loss. There's some data around uh, loss one-third of the food produced for human consumption, one-third is lost or wasted globally. That's about 1.3 billion tons per year. So we think it's an area where education and investment can make uh, a real difference. We established an institute, an ADM institute, for the prevention of post-harvest loss at the University of Illinois. And we feel like it's an institute that can share best practices and make a difference around some of this loss prevention because, of course, what you don't lose, you don't have to grow, and, and uh, makes a real difference in, in uh, creating more feedstuffs. So that's a bit of an overview of how we look at the growing middle class and the opportunity it presents and uh, how we might capitalize on those opportunities. Certainly at ADM, I think it's a tremendously exciting uh, opportunity. While it is challenging, I think the ability to serve these vital needs throughout the world uh, and these new middle class customers is, is really an invigorating and frankly gratifying uh, kind of role. And, and it's often because we know food isn't just a commodity. It's not just about the nutrition to survive. Uh, food is actually a fundamental part of a culture everywhere in the world. Uh, we do a lot of things over food. We celebrate, we mourn, we negotiate, we bond. Uh, we court each other over food. Even today, we met over a lunch uh, over food. So I don't think it's just a sustenance for life. It's actually, it is life, and it's about quality of life. And the knowledge that more and more people will have access to better diets, better health, the improved education and productivity that comes with that, 
the better quality of life that a better diet can provide. I think it's just a very meaningful um, and source of tremendous optimism. So I hope that as you look at the decade ahead, you also find that this rise in the middle class has some optimism for you and your businesses. I would encourage if you haven't done a strategic review of late that looks out over the next decade or more, um, I'd suggest you step back and, and do that. Uh, take a look at the opportunities that are before you, and I hope you're as excited as we are about uh, what we see. And I wish you all the best as you uh, look at that and you seize those opportunities. So thank you very much. We're going to have a little different format for our Q&A session. Uh, Pat and I are going to start it off with a bit of a conversation because I don't often uh, really get a chance to quiz a uh, supplier of General Mills on some of the things I've always wanted to ask we about. We promise no pricing questions. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I'm going to ask uh, Pat a couple questions and then we will open it up for, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the group to ask whatever they want to know. So I guess, Pat, the first question maybe on everybody's mind is, um, why did you decide to move the headquarters to Chicago instead of Minneapolis? First question, huh? <laughs> uh, I, as I mentioned, Minneapolis was our home, and it certainly was on the list as we looked. Uh, we considered all kinds of things related to transportation hubs and education and criteria that uh, uh, Minnesota is a wonderful place and Minneapolis is a great place. At the end, it turned out that Chicago was a better fit for us. Uh, but as I mentioned, what a what an important uh, part of the world for growth here. And uh, maybe it's something I didn't mention. You're when... not a Blackhawks fan, are you? I'm a Blackhawks fan. <laughs> <laughs> Your wild was so good, so good. Such a great young team. Um, was your, is your economic club itself. Uh, I learned from Mark and others that it's really only six years old, which is kind of a phenomenal uh, statistic because you've grown so much in both what you're able to accomplish, who you attract, how the discussions you have. Um, I think it's representative of the business community in Minneapolis and uh, all the energy and excitement around it. Well, that's very nice. If you change your mind, we're here. We're here for you. <laughs> thanks, thanks. <laughs> um, and by the way, my team's here. They want to <laughs> continue to see us grow in uh, Minneapolis, too. The, uh, the comments you were making about the uh, middle class and the uh, opportunities that their increased uh, uh, economic pet potential and uh, 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 convenience foods and, and all that is something we really experienced at General Mills too. And, and, and the question we sometimes got, and I'll pose it to you, is um, how do we, do we extend the benefits of uh, the, quote, Western diet, more protein, uh, better affordability, and all the great things about a Western diet, while avoiding what are viewed as some of the disadvantages, the downsides of it, the rise in obesity and, and, uh, and related diseases like diabetes and so on. And I expect you get that, that question too. What, uh, what do you, what's, how do you think about that? I think it's that? an excellent point. Um, you know, if you think about the, uh, uh, the portion sizes and everything related to our U U.S. diet, sometimes we refer to it as a Western diet. I, I lived in Canada for a number of years, and I remember my Canadian friends would say, to me, what is this all-you-can-eat thing you have, <laughs> you know, in the in the United States? We don't we don't have that here. You know? So some of it is moderation and so forth, which goes with education uh, and the like. Your point about protein, there's also more trends around more protein and more fiber in a diet, maybe replacing uh, some of the fats, some of the uh, sweetened with the sugars in the diet. Uh, so it's possible some communities and some uh, developing nations will do a little bit of this leapfrogging, maybe not have to go through a difficulty in their diet before they get to more um, in, in informed ways of eating that, just like cell phones, right? Somebody skipped the, yeah. uh, many people have skipped the idea of a landline and they've kind of gone to the next generation. There's a bit about food consumption and good diets and good knowledge around diets that, you know, could go with that. There's doesn't necessarily need to be something that is in the middle that's harmful. Well, that's a very positive uh, uh, prospect, I think. That's a good thought. Um, I was also taken by your example of the, the uh, challenge of feeding uh, the, the world over the next 40 years compared to all, all the time up to this point and, and the need for agricultural productivity. And, and it occurs to me that one of the uh, great 
opportunities for agricultural productivity lies in, in the area of biotechnology, seed biotechnology, and, and, uh, and I suppose uh, maybe animal bio, but, but GMOs in general. Um, and, and I guess uh, I'd be interested in how you think about the conflict between the productivity opportunity that that presents and the kind of persistent public uh, resistance in the developed world to GMOs uh, the, to, to really embracing the, the potential of GMOs fully. You know, innovation and technology is critically important, I think, to any kind of productivity and certainly has been in agriculture's productivity. Um, at ADM, we sort of think about, well, first of all, we would agree with the UN's World Health Organization about the um, capability of technology to add to the productivity of of agriculture and help feed the world as they look forward to the same, some of the same statistics that uh, I referred to. But we also serve customers. So we think about, do we have the large enough uh, capabilities for segregation for some customers that may want something that is different than another customer? So some may want non-GMO of this or that variety and we have the ability to serve those customers. Um, I, my view in the long term, although I predicted this earlier, is that we'll have more discussion that's science-based on um, seed technology and the opportunities that provides to the rest of the world, and it will be less based on whatever the uh, maybe the geopolitics are of, of the day. But it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> So I'm I, actually I, surprised. I, I think I expected the same thing when I looked at this question 10 years ago, and it's kind of surprising that that the, the, the balance really hasn't shifted. Our in, friends in from you know Syngenta or Monsanto or DuPont, uh, the worlds who are on the leading edge of some of these uh, technology, also believe there's you know more optimism, but it keeps seem to be shifted out um, farther in uh, a little bit farther in the future. Good. Um, let me ask one more, and then we'll we'll open it up for questions from the audience. I. Uh, when you talked about connect, uh, connectivity and the need to move money and, and people and goods across boundaries, it, 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 uh, which is a trend that we've all uh, experienced and it seemed for years, in recent years, that there really weren't too many political impediments to that. I mean, you had places like North Korea and Iran that you know, uh, were, were spots that you, you know, would block the, that kind of uh, connectivity and free flow. But generally, the world was becoming a more open place to do business. Recently, it feels like uh, you know, there, there are conflicts cropping up in places like Ukraine and Russia and, and, uh, and Syria and other places. And I wonder if, if you run into any of those, because you've got very, very broadly global operations, and, and uh, if you'd share with us how you're dealing with them. So I think an inter if you think about trade flow in general, you're right. I think the world kind of moved to a much more global world, right, in the last decade. But it seems to... Uh, the last four or five years, not just geopolitically, but there are disruptions and major disruptions to flow, uh, either happening because of an Arab Spring, because of a tsunami, <laughs> because of a drought, because of uh, floods, uh, because of geopolitical disruptions of different sorts, whether they be trade embargoes or uh, turning a boat around because it no longer meets a specification, which you know may not be true. It may be more about a, a trade issue, um, import-export differences that uh, uh, that cause our kinds of companies, uh, Cargill and others in the room, to still meet customers' needs because we can get it from somewhere else. So when there's a disruption here, because you're a global connector, you the way we deal with it, sometimes it's actually an opportunity. We'd never wish ill on anyone, but when there's a disruption, sometimes if you can serve that customer from somewhere else because you have a global network, that's a positive. That means we kind of um, stabilize things or we create less volatility because we're able to serve that customer. But I think we're often arguing for uh, open trade and we're arguing for no sanctions and we're arguing for the idea of free flow of goods and, uh, and services and people and so forth. So when you look at, for example, the Ukraine today, I'm often asked, how's that going to affect our business? Yeah. Um, first of all, the most important thing in that area is always we, we think about our employees' safety, so our employees are safe. We have a dozen or so um, storage facilities, silos, we have a processing plant, we have export port. Um, so things are flowing okay at the moment, and uh, business hasn't been disrupted, but there's estimates that they'll have reduction in, um, in, in wheat supplies and 
you know, when you think down the road that there may be two countries and not one, or one and a half countries, or uh, it's a, it, it is a concern. It is a concern. Very interesting. Good. Let's let's see if there are questions out in the. Uh, I, uh, and, and we have a mic. Let's go back here. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to Minneapolis. Um, I was wondering how you think about uh, kind of shifting weather patterns and weather volatility. You know, we all enjoyed a terrific winter here in Minnesota, so um, we're maybe a bit more sensitive to that topic um, this year than maybe in the past. So, do you do you see your risks going up and needing to manage those risks more, or not necessarily so? And how are you doing that in terms of changing weather patterns? Thanks. Sure. Uh, so we have sort of experts and meteorologists that look longer term, and then probably more importantly, we have ones that look shorter term, sometimes within a uh, particular harvest period. So of course, we're here in North America, and we're here in, uh, in Minnesota. So there's one way to deal with changing weather patterns is to continue to diversify your portfolio. So in our case, we're very strong in North America. And, have been for our 120, 12 years as we've continued to grow. But we'd only entered South America maybe 25 years ago, so we're continuing to build our uh, portfolio to have a northern southern hemisphere balance that allows not only, you know, the globe kind of shifts from feeding the world from North America in the, um, in the, in the, after our harvest and then shifting to South America for their harvest. So one of the opportunities is always to have more of a globally diversified um, footprint. Uh, we uh, were interested in entering the Australian market, for example. Australian wheat has certain components and capabilities that are different and preferred by certain customers there, and that gives you an offset for our large wheat, product, wheat milling operations in North America. So. I think the longer term patterns, you know, you probably know as, as well as anyone, are somewhat shifting north. There's more growth uh, in Canada and even farther north than there's been in the past as far as plantings. And sometimes uh, producers or farmers are shifting what they plant and where they plant and how, if at all, uh, they are irrigated. So there have been changes and we just watch those changes. Our big customers, so to speak, are our farmers or producers. It's uh, the first industry I've ever related to that your supplier actually is so important to you, you call them your customer. So we call the farmers that we deal with in our long-term relationships our customers, even though we buy their grain, because it's very important to know what they're thinking, what they're planting, when they're thinking about it, and so forth. So uh, certainly some shifts longer term, but in our case, it's uh, always about watching the, uh, the next year and the next horizon. Thank you. Pat, thank you for coming and sharing your insights. Um, you know, we've read a lot in the in the papers around the uh, many infrastructure issues we have, uh, the rail the rail lines, and the problems we're having with just transporting product around the country. And it seems like we've got just this fundamental issue that we're we're so far behind on building out infrastructure that, you know, what you just described for us is uh, an interesting future, but we're not going to be able to meet the demand because we just can't get our act together on you know, these big decisions as a, you know, either as an organization or so forth. So what role are you playing to um, really try to influence Washington and kind of public policy around that? Uh, it's a great question and issue, and it's one of the major reasons why I accepted joining the President's Export Council. The council is a combination of a handful of CEOs, cabinet members, uh, and the Commerce Department, and Secretary Pritzker leads the effort and has several um, uh, colleagues that kind of drive different committee structures. And one of the committees that uh, I participate on is the Infrastructure Committee. So we have spent a fair amount of time not only getting data, but making recommendations about future investments in, in uh, river facilities, in highways, in the rail infrastructure, et cetera. And it has different buckets of where dollars can come from and the highway fund, and you probably know there's, there's some complications associated with it, but it's extremely important. Uh, am I optimistic that it will have the attention it needs or the priority it needs? It's actually quite a bipartisan issue when you think about infrastructure. Usually it's not something that uh, requires a 
uh, an, an argument or, or controversy. So I have more optimism than I'd had before, but this winter was a great example of not only this country, but Canada had some real, real issues as well. And uh, I think we, we all need to pay attention to infrastructure and education are kind of the biggest investments for the future generation. It's not one that you need to put off maintenance. I agree with you. I think we have time for one more question. There was one over here. Given the increased attention that is being placed on derivatives right now, what impact do you have, do you think that's going to have on both you and your customers? Well, um, we're, we're not very active in the derivatives market. So we've kind of, uh, well, some of my colleagues may see it differently because of their uh, activity. We've kind of been neutral about any of the changes associated with uh, recommendations about the market. We kind of run a hedged book, so to speak, meaning that we try to, you know, um, keep our, we, we try to help keep margins where they need to be and work with customers to offset their risk. So uh, we'll see where the future goes. I think in the, in the last several years, different players than those who are um, hard asset managers of commodities. So uh, entered, the, entered the world and they didn't have the physical um, assets to back it up. So they made it much more volatile and much more risky. So that's why some of the controversy associated with uh, the commodities market is, has been talked about a lot more. But companies like ourselves and Cargill and so forth, we're in the hard asset business as well. So, and we have people on the ground everywhere, which gives us a little bit of, um, I think, stronger knowledge associated with risk management. And, and we haven't changed our risk approach uh, as a result of that. Okay, I just have one more question that I'd like to, to, uh, to ask you as we, as we wrap up here, and it's more of a personal nature. You've had a, uh, a terrific career, you've, you've accomplished a lot. I'm wondering if you have any uh, management principles or philosophy that you could share with our audience today that, uh, that they might benefit from hearing. Ooh. Um, well, I kind of think leaders have a responsibility to make complicated things simple. So in my simple way of thinking about it, I have sort of four little words I use all the time when I think about leadership and that's been helpful to me in my career and that's be, no, do, care. Be, no, do, care. So be to me is always about leading from your principles, from your values. So be yourself, be who you are. Uh, bring your whole self to the table, to your job. Uh, sometimes people ask me about, you know, don't, don't you have to check something at the door? And, uh, you know, maybe earlier in my career I did that, but I think you need <laughs> to be completely uh, present and full and with your full energy. In fact, the word, uh, a rhetorist once told me that the word integrity, right, integrity, you know, we know what that means, but it comes from the Latin derivation of integer. An integer is whole, right? It's the whole number. It's the whole person. So really, if we have integrity, we do bring our whole selves to the, to the table, to our job. And that means you know, everything that we can contribute. And sometimes that's not only our, our brains and our emotion and our team and our players, but it's, uh, you know, it's sometimes our passion about uh, what's right. So be, uh, be no, no, I have a, I believe in lifelong learning. I'm, uh, I'm constantly thinking there's better ways to do things, better ways to learn, better things to know. So know is always meant to me, know your job, know everything around your job, know every, uh, the before your job and the after your job, and kind of expand your horizon of what you know, and uh, you're always able to contribute more there. So be no do. Um, do is kind of being biased towards action, maybe a little more action than study, uh, because sometimes if you study something to its, uh, it's nth degree to get the 100%. You know, you maybe miss the opportunity. So be no do. It's kind of the, the relentless positive action. So action is the third one. And then care, I kind of added that over the years as I thought about it because we do nothing ourselves. We really, it's about caring for your team and your people. And if you don't care, um, you know, you won't have the right safety of focus or you won't have the right customer focus and, and the like. So those four Little words have helped me over the years. Maybe that's uh, uh, that's something you might call. That's great. Leadership I have to write philosophy. them down because I won't remember them in the right order. But uh. <laughs> they're simple. <laughs> <laughs> that is simple. That's great. Well, let's uh, let's uh, give uh, Pat a great round of applause. For you. Thank you. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class, nonpartisan forum 
for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.